President Bush and Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping toasting one another at tonight's farewell banquet in Beijing, a banquet overshadowed by controversy over China's stand on human rights. This is the CBS Evening News. Susan Spencer reporting. Good evening. While President Bush toasted the Chinese, his choice for Secretary of Defense went on the offensive today about reports that he has a drinking problem. John Tower declared that if confirmed, he will drink no alcohol whatsoever. We'll have more on that later. First, developments in China. Here's Dan Rather. Good evening. Beijing, China, day two. The Chinese president today proclaimed this visit a big event in U.S.-Chinese relations, telling President Bush, the Chinese people know you well, and so do you know them. At the Great Hall of the People, it was reunion day for George Bush and Deng Xiaoping. The senior Chinese communist leader wished President Bush a hearty welcome. We too are good friends for a long time. Delighted to see you looking so well. The 84-year-old Deng observed, you're an athlete. That's why you're in good shape. President Bush has a jam-packed 40-hour visit before heading off tomorrow morning for Korea. Jacqueline Adams has been following the Bushes. An embarrassment for George Bush tonight. Chinese police barred the country's leading dissident, Feng Li Zhe, from a banquet to which he'd been invited by the president. That means the government don't like my opinion about the how to... Uh, we, we ask a more democracy. I think they were afraid that he would say something about human rights in China uh, that would make an impression that would uh, not be in their interests. The incident came just hours after the White House spokesman admitted Mr. Bush had failed to raise the issue of human rights in his meetings with top leaders here. The human rights was not discussed, yes. We too are good friends for a long time. In the president's meeting with Deng Xiaoping, the primary topic was Mikhail Gorbachev. Both sides seemed preoccupied with the thaw in Sino-Soviet relations. We had an interesting exchange on the forthcoming visit of uh, General Secretary Gorbachev coming here. And it is important that they understand what I am thinking. So important that the president seemed to be on a public relations offensive appearing in the first live interview an American president has ever given on Chinese television. But U.S. officials insist they're not afraid of renewed Soviet influence here in China or of the Gorbachev charm. We're winning on substance. He may be winning on, on PR and perception, so it doesn't bother us, not one bit. American presidents don't hesitate to spotlight human rights abuses in the Soviet Union. After tonight's incident, George Bush may wish he'd spent more time criticizing leaders here than courting them. Jacqueline Adams, CBS News, with the president in Beijing. This is Bill Plant in Beijing. The White House called President Bush's meeting with Chinese leaders a remarkable and unprecedented dialogue. But two items are remarkable by their absence. The president did not discuss human rights with the Chinese, and he did not ask about charges that China is shipping missiles to Libya via North Korea. Mr. Bush did not talk to his hosts about Chinese dissidents like Fang Li Zhu. Yet when the U.S. talks to the Soviets, human rights questions are usually the first item on the agenda. And the Chinese then returned the favor by refusing to allow Professor Fang to attend the president's dinner. As for the missiles, officials say the president simply accepted Chinese Premier Li Peng's assurance that China would act in a, quote, responsible manner, unquote, on missile sales. The White House says it's satisfied. But those for whom both issues are important are likely to dispute the rosy administration view. Bill Plant, CBS News, Beijing. Sunday is a good day to get some sense of the people of this, the most populous country in the world. On a mild winter day like today, parents bring the children to Purple Bamboo Park. <laughs> it helps to watch the children play in trying to understand the challenges facing China. In this vast, great country, 29 babies are born each minute. 15 and a half million came into the world last year alone, pushing China's population to more than a billion. The government spends 20% of its income trying to feed and care for them. The iron rice bowl, they call it. They eat three million tons of grain annually. The government tries to limit families to just one child to ease the strain of caring for so many. 
But watching the intense joy children here give their parents and remembering how hard joy is to come by in this country, you begin to understand why China has so much trouble controlling population and moving forward. At one end of the park is a special place called the English Corner. It's a place where intellectuals and students for the last four or five years have been gathering to practice their English and talk over ideas. Living standards is quite low. We are poor just because the population, I think. Is this your only child? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, this is my only boy, only son. Mm. Uh, I, I think uh, a person uh, should have two children. <laughs> but children weren't the only thing on people's minds here today. I want uh, Mr. Bushy uh, uh, trust China's uh, reform. They were talking about the upcoming visit of Soviet Secretary Gorbachev. We are uh, very pleased um, to um, connect with um, them. So you think this is a good thing? Ah, uh, yeah. They had not so friendly thoughts about their neighbors, the Japanese. Japan is, uh, I don't know really. The country gives so many disasters to China. Mostly, they were concerned about the future of their country. It takes time to change the situation. So I wish that everyone will give Chinese time. Now China has a key balance between socialism and capitalism. That is, the socialism with China Chinese characteristics. <laughs> My fellow CBS News correspondent Bruce Morton visited China five years ago with President Reagan. He notes the changes that have swept this country since that time. A Chinese poet wrote, the sky is gray, the road is gray, the building is gray, the rain is gray. In this blanket of dead gray, two children walk by, one bright red, one pale green. Some mornings, this city still looks that way. But really, that is yesterday, the ghost of Beijing past. The country people pour into the railroad station, gate but ads on the big green screen, listen to Beethoven's computerized notes on the loudspeaker. They don't have to walk very far to see lots of color, lots of fashionable clothes. A returning visitor finds traces of the older city. The songbird market still does business, but you can buy leather jackets as easily as song. The sidewalk barbers create skinheads on demand, but high stylists work their magic too. Candied apples on a street corner, no problem. A woodwind quintet with your dry martini, that's no problem either. Fishermen drop their hooks in the dirty canal as always, but the high rises swoop and soar around them, and that never used to be. People pour into the city looking for fast new money. 20,000 a year or so pour into this marriage bureau, looking for love or a hopeful face in the big city or whatever. About a third of them, the staff say, find something, usually marriage. And the visitor, now as always, sees the children. One to a family, they tell you. The limit usually works in the cities, they say. But the visitor sees many children, and the enormous numbers echo in your mind. More than a billion people, a fifth of the world. They are living better than in older times, but their country now imports grain. The city seems full of children, and a visitor wonders what their lives will hold, who will lead them, and in what direction. Old and new mingle on these streets. The visitor asks all the questions, and hears few answers. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Beijing. Susan Spencer will have the day's other news, plus a look at the Pacific Century on Inside Sunday, coming up next. Well, the way things are going, John Tower may never take the oath, but today he took the pledge, as David Martin reports. Trying to salvage his nomination as Secretary of Defense, John Tower took to the offense today with an extraordinary pledge to go on the wagon. I hereby swear and undertake that if confirmed during the course of my tenure as Secretary of Defense, I will not consume any beverage alcohol of any type or form, including wine, beer, spirits of any kind. Speaking publicly for the first time since his nomination was rejected by the Senate Armed Services Senator Committee, Tower admitted he once drank too much. I used to be a pretty good scotch drinker. 
and uh, I gave up. I haven't tasted scotch in 12 years. Uh, after that, I had uh, only wine, had perhaps uh, an occasional martini, uh, occasionally a little vodka with uh, smoked salmon or caviar. Shuttling between Sunday talk shows, Tower was asked if there are still times when he drinks too much. I think that's a question of judgment. I've never been to the point where I have uh, lost control of my faculties. There's adequate testimony to that. Now, Tower released a letter from one of his doctors stating the former senator, quote, shows no evidence at all of alcoholic impairment. The Tower said he will not submit to an independent medical examination. Why should I? Why should I? Uh, that's a suggestion that I'm lying about my condition. It's a suggestion that my own doctors are lying about it. Much of the evidence against Tower is contained in a still-secret FBI report. Senate Armed Services Chairman Sam Nunn warned the White House against putting out its own version of what's in that report. We would have no alternative but to open the hearings and go back and subpoena some people. To win on the Senate floor, Tower needs all 45 Republican votes and five Democrats. But one Republican, Cassabaum of Kansas, is already on record as saying she thinks Tower should withdraw. Tower plans to continue his public offensive but the fate of his nomination will likely be decided in private when starting tomorrow, members of the Senate sit down to read the FBI report detailing the allegations against him. David Martin, CBS News, Washington. United Airlines today ordered stepped-up door inspections for its 747 fleet, that in the wake of the Flight 811 disaster. Jerry Bowen has the latest now on that investigation. Coast Guard search vessels returned to Honolulu this morning with more debris from the ill-fated United flight. Parts of overhead bins, seats, personal belongings, including shoes. But there is no hope for the nine passengers pulled from the 747 jet when the section around the right cargo door ruptured. The crew said that they had no difficulty in shutting the cargo doors. They also said that there was no problems with any of the door lights. Investigators are focusing more on the failure of the cargo door to hold as the cause of the disaster. The FBI has found no evidence of a bomb. Metals experts say there are no signs of stress in the metal around the huge opening, no signs of pre-existing cracks. Instead, say investigators, the damage is consistent with overload stress, a door frame, metal cover, or locking mechanism somehow stretched to the point of failure. And it is produced by a single event, as if you were snapping or breaking a piece of material. The cargo door lock now under scrutiny was scheduled to be improved under an FAA directive. Initially, United said the lock was not a factor. Now, the airline says it cannot speculate on the cause. United also announced today it is checking the cargo doors on all its aircraft, especially the 747s, as a precaution. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Honolulu. was visiting familiar turf today, a Soviet official was breaking new ground, the first foreign minister to hold direct talks with the ruler of Iran. Bill McLaughlin in London reports. Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadze, who seems to have seized the diplomatic initiative from the U.S. and the Middle East, today scored another political coup, a rare meeting with Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini. At a meeting in Tehran, Shevardnadze told the Ayatollah that Moscow wanted new cooperation with Iran in all fields. Khomeini agreed and even suggested an alliance with the Soviet Union against what he termed the devilish acts of the West. Iran's relations with the West are near total rupture, strained to the breaking point by Khomeini's call for the murder of Salman Rushdie, author of the allegedly anti-Islamic novel, The Satanic Verses. Muslims around the world continue to demonstrate in support of the Ayatollah's deadly campaign against the Rushdie novel. This one took place today in Paris and another in a pro-Iranian stronghold in Beirut. Bill McLaughlin, CBS News, London. A bomb exploded today at a British cultural center in Karachi, Pakistan, killing a security guard. Police linked that blast to the protest against Rushdie, who lives in England. On his way to Asia, President Bush took note of the growing importance of the Pacific region this century. We do the same tonight on Inside Sunday as we look at the impact of change in the area. We begin in South Korea. Mr. Bush will be there tomorrow. Today, there were violent protests there. As Richard Wagner reports, change in Korea does not come easily. For many Americans, this is Korea. Radicals clashing with the authorities. An anti-government movement led by militant students. The traditional conscience of Korea. Korean people think uh, the students uh, represent 
the democratic aspiration of the people. Lock Hill Sioux is one of those students. He's 24 years old, middle class, from a small town near the demilitarized zone. The son of a shopkeeper, Law is an angry young man. He's supported in his anger by trade unionists and farmers outraged at government policies. Ironically, those policies have made Korea an economic powerhouse. But that very success has awakened a hunger among Law and his friends for more more political and economic changes. They also want reunification of their country. They say they're not communists, and even the government doesn't see them as a threat from the North. I don't think they are uh, encouraged or subsidized by the North Korean regime. It is sort of indigenous movement for uh, a full degree of socialism and so forth. Although the protesters are few in number, they do represent a view being held by an increasing number of Koreans who are more than willing to allow the students to speak for them. Those opposing tomorrow's visit of President Bush accuse the U.S. of a history of propping up corrupt South Korean governments and of preventing reunification of the two Koreas to keep South Korea dependent on the United States. Hoping to cool the conflict, officials here are counting on this nation's spreading prosperity to bring the dissidents, the students, farmers, and trade unionists, into the mainstream. With the passage of time, I hope it would uh, calm down and they would be more and more satisfied with the uh, rules of uh, liberal democracy in my country. Korea is a country in transition. Without a tradition of political freedom, it's lurching toward democracy in fits and starts. How it copes with protest may determine if it's maturing politically as rapidly as it's growing economically. Richard Wagner, CBS News, Seoul. There's another fight for political change going on in Cambodia. President Bush pledged support for rebel leader Norodom Sihanouk today at a meeting in Beijing. Some Cambodians have come to America to escape the war there. But as David Dow tells us, they have found life here another kind of battle. In a rundown house in central California, Buddhist monks offer ancient prayers. They are spiritual leaders for a troubled flock, the refugees who fled the killing fields of Cambodia, only to become mired in poverty in California. I think that um, the older ones will never get off of assistance. In the crowded apartment complexes of San Joaquin County, more than 70% of the Cambodian families receive some form of welfare, the highest rate for any refugee group. Most are like Sereth Kim, unable to speak English or find work. I want to work, he says, but it takes English. The Holocaust that forced Kim to flee his country killed as many as four million people, including most of the nation's leaders and intellectuals. The majority who survived and escaped and became the second wave of Cambodian refugees were poor farmers like Kim. They may not have been literate in their language, so this whole idea of learning to read and write is a new process. In your country, how do you find a job? Sometimes I find... There are English classes and vocational counseling, but the threat of losing welfare benefits, which may amount to the equivalent of $7 an hour, fights such efforts to encourage employment. For someone who doesn't read and write or speak English, finding a job at $7 an hour is almost impossible. Many place their hope in a new generation that speaks English and studies hard. The generation of Sarah Kim's daughter, who works after school to gain experience and finance a car. I want to become part of the U.S. <laughs> like America, yeah. And so, too, do her elders. But for them, the struggle to belong is harder, plagued by the tough realities of a new life and an old one they can't forget. David Dow, CBS News, Los Angeles. From the realities of life to the realities of death and how the Japanese deal with it. That story is next as Inside Sunday continues on the CBS Evening News. Finally tonight, changing notions in Japan about matters of life and death. There's a new debate going on there about whether a patient should be told when he has a terminal illness. 
American doctors agonize over how best to deal with the dying, how to balance the patient's rights with the family's needs. In Japan, there is little such discussion. The game plan is always clear. Let the doctor do what the medically you know, needed. But don't tell the patient? No. And don't tell the family? No. But a budding patients' rights movement in Japan is now challenging that tradition, denouncing the idea that all powerful doctors have to protect weaker patients from bad news. Interestingly, doctors want to be told when they have terminal illness, but when in turn they ask if they would tell the patient, they say no. They have to pretend you are a lie. So understandably, Japan until now has had no hospices, since by tradition, doctors couldn't acknowledge that a patient was dying. But these cancer patients have decided that is not what they want. As they dedicated Japan's first freestanding hospice, they talked about resenting the authority of doctors over their lives. I know I will die in pain, she says. If so, I want to die in a hospice, peacefully. They feel that nobody talk about death or cancer or grief, but they really want to have a chance to talk or they express their feeling. Open expression of feelings is not a very Japanese trait, but holding back can put a terrible strain on a family. This group organized for parents who have lost a child. Doctors, this parent says, are so haughty and authoritative. Sharing grief of losing a child, another adds, relieves us of the stress. But it does not give patients more control over their destinies, and that is what the tiny hospice movement is working for. I don't like the word rights, but uh, uh, I hope myself, you know, uh, I'd like to have a choice for my life. Changing attitudes. That's the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather will be back tomorrow, and I'll see you later on tonight on the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Susan Spencer. Have a good evening. To the secrets to help you win the shopping war beginning tomorrow on CBS This Morning. This is CBS. Coming up on 11 News, Houston's crackdown on crack.